Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second fireside chat. Please welcome President of the Ounce of Prevention Fund, Dr. Diana Rahner. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm Diana Rauner, the president of the Ounce of Prevention Fund, a leading national early childhood education organization that brings together research, practice, professional development, and policy in an effort to ensure that all children have the access to the highest quality early education and care opportunities and experiences, regardless of what state they call home. Now, if you were around earlier, you probably heard me say a few times, children are born learning. Education doesn't begin when a child enters the kindergarten classroom. As we know, education begins at birth. And of course, we also know that those first few years of life are the most important time for them to set them on the path of success in school and in life. Uh, just having a conversation um, with a state senator from Kentucky about um, what states do, educate, medicate, and incarcerate. 90% <laughs> of states' budgets are spent um, supporting um, education and remediating from the challenges of those who are not able to participate in the economic and civic mainstream. What we know is that from evidence is that children who have not had high quality early learning experiences are likely to remain behind throughout their educational careers. And these gaps can last a lifetime and end up costing our society and individual people tremendously. We know that high quality, and I want to stress high quality, early learning and care opportunities are proven to ensure that a child's experiences before kindergarten are preparing her socially, emotionally, and cognitively for all of the challenges and expectations of schooling and life. And we have to be sure that as a nation, we are ensuring that every child enters kindergarten ready to learn. We cannot expect the K-12 system to systemically address the achievement gap if we do not have children entering kindergarten ready to learn. And for most middle income and low income families, Finding and affording high quality educational early learning and care opportunities is often not an option. And as bad as it is for preschoolers, it's even worse for infants and toddlers when the brain is most active and most fragile. And that's why I'm most honored to introduce this afternoon's very, um, next discussion and very honored guest. As a former preschool teacher, she knows how important the early learning years are, the early years of a child's life are, and why investing in America's youngest learners is so critical to the future of our nation. As a United States Senator and the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, our next speaker is a steadfast champion for early childhood education on Capitol Hill, working closely with Democrats and Republicans like her good friend, Senator Chairman Lamar Alexander, whom we heard from this morning, on solutions that support children and families across the country. Just last month, she reintroduced the Child Care for Working Families Act, a bill that would significantly expand access to high quality child care and early learning for low and middle income families by bringing down rising child care costs, making major investments in training and compensation for early educators, and significantly expanding access to high quality preschool for low and middle income three and four year olds. She's a true leader, unwavering in her commitment, and I'm very excited to hear what she has to say this afternoon. But before we bring her up on stage, I'd like to introduce the moderator of this fireside chat, Melissa Boteach, Vice President for Income Security and Child Care Early Learning at the National Women's Law Center. And now, it is a true honor to introduce to you our distinguished special guest, the senior senator from the state of Washington, Patty Murray. Senator Murray, thank you so much for agreeing to have this conversation. We're so excited to hear your perspectives as one of the foremost leaders of childcare and early education in the country. 
And we know from just from your introduction that this has been a lifelong commitment for you. It's something that your personal experience has informed. And so I was wondering if we could kick off by having you speak a little bit about your own personal experiences in the childcare early learning world um, as a parent, as a teacher, uh, on school board, and talking about how that has brought you to the Senate and informed the policy recommendations you've championed. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't be sitting in front of you as a United States Senator if preschool and the support of preschool in my own state hadn't intervened. I actually, uh, when I was a young mom and had um, two little kids, I enrolled them in a cooperative preschool program in my state, which was run through the community college system. It was parent education for the parents, and it was a preschool program for the kids. I loved the program because even though I had a college degree, nobody taught me how to be a mom. <laughs> and, uh, and I felt that was probably the most important role that I needed to be prepared for. So I, was, I loved the program and I uh, took my kids to class one day and was told that it was uh, gonna end in a month because our state legislature had decided to take the funding away from this program. And I just looked at our instructor and said, well, who the heck are they? <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, they're your state legislators. They work out of the Capitol. And, and so I put my two kids, they were one and three, in my car and drove 100 miles to our state Capitol. Now, I was born and raised in the state of Washington, but I had never been to our Capitol. Uh, but I drove there, parked, and just started walking through the Capitol to find out who these people were that didn't know what they were doing and were taking this funding away. <laughs> Uh, and I talked to, to a number of people, but I finally um, got kind of pushed to this one state legislator, and he agreed to meet with me, and he listened to how great this program was, and looked directly at me and said, well, you can't make a difference, you're just a mom in tennis shoes. Which Wrong answer. <laughs> stunned me, and I was like, well, yeah. Um, and I drove home for 100 miles telling these poor little kids in my backseat that this was not gonna get taken away by these people in Olympia, went to work, started organizing other moms and dads across my state who enrolled in the program, and we organized an entire group of more than 13,000 moms and dads in just a few months and inundated our state capitol with um, our own personal stories about how important this program was. We brought our kids to the state capitol. We sort of in inundated every committee hearing with young kids. Uh, and after a few months, they couldn't take it anymore and they reinstated the funding. <laughs> so, that was really what drove me into politics because I really realized that things that I felt were important also were felt important by other people and if you didn't advocate for what you believed in and fought, fought for it, you could lose it. Uh, and I ended up uh, running for that very state legislature and beating a 15-year incumbent uh, and, and ended up serving in the state senate where I uh, really focused on the issues affecting families and young children. And then, of course, um, Clarence Thomas gave a speech back here in a little hearing that happened in 1992. And I listened to it and started paying attention to what was happening in Washington, D.C. and realized that there weren't any people who looked like me, who had the same experiences, who knew how important some of these things were, and ended up running for the, the U.S. Senate back in 1992 and stunned absolutely everybody by having a grassroots campaign. Remember all those people I told you I just organized? They went out and worked for me. Uh, and, and I've been here since 1992 and have been so fortunate to serve on the very committee that I think is the heart and soul of our nation, which deals with health care and education and higher education, because I so strongly believe that if we don't have those skills and we start them at an early age and continue them throughout our whole country's futures at stake, and we have to invest in, in those kinds of issues and policies. So that's sort of what got me here. Right. So we're fast forwarding to today, and now you're on the other side, and you are one of the senators that is regularly lifting up the voices and experiences of parents, of providers, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you're hearing today. What are you hearing about the momentum that is growing for child care and early learning as a national priority, and what is sort of some of the, the stories that are coming to you um, that animate that, uh, that prioritization? Sure, I'll talk about that, and I will also tell you that in between when I advocated for that parent education program and uh, ran for the U.S. Senate, I. Uh, got my, um, turned my degree and began teaching in parent education, co-op preschool. So I taught preschool uh, and, uh, and had that experience with me as well. 
Uh, and so people in my state know who I am. They, they know what I advocate for. So it is no surprise that today, it doesn't matter where I go, I can be in a boardroom of Microsoft. I can be at the grocery store. I can be anywhere. And the number one issue people bring up to me is the lack of affordable quality childcare. And I have heard so many stories how it is a barrier to people to be able to <coughs> Uh, take care of their families, to be able to uh, get a better job, uh, all of the, the things that we know. And as a preschool teacher, I know that if we are not investing in those young kids at an early age, we are losing out. Uh, and if they are in unsafe settings or not getting the kind of education and skills they need, um, then our country is going to lose our ability to have a high quality workforce to compete in a global market. So the number one issue I hear is from people is the barriers to getting access to early childhood education, quality edu early childhood education in their communities. Rural, suburban, uh, in our big cities, in our uh, best marketplaces where people have the highest cost of living to the lowest cost of living, this is the number one issue. Yeah, I can agree with that as a parent of preschool age children. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, there was this recent historic um, increase in childcare funding that you championed yeah. um, and that we got into law and it's had such an impact in the states. Can you speak a little bit about what that money has meant to Washington state um, and why we still need additional investments to sort of build on the success of that investment? Well, one of the things I started working on as a, co a couple of years ago, and I'm fortunate to be the top Democrat on the committee that oversees the spending on all of this, the Health, Health Education Labor Committee, uh, and the chairman of that, uh, Senator Blunt, uh, I began bugging him and telling him how important it was that we invest in uh, early learning and the Child Development Block Grant was a critical place that we have on our committee where we can provide additional funds. And we're able to have the, the biggest increase in funding ever two years ago and then an additional increase last year in child development. And I told them my stories of all those moms who came up to me and what their barriers were and what they were fighting for and how important this fund was in particular. Uh, my state has used the increase, like m many of the other states, uh, to provide additional capacity, which means that our lower income families have better access uh, to early childhood education. Uh, we've seen across the board increases in salaries, which I'm happy to tell you why that's important. Uh, the turnover rate is really high in our early childhood le learning cent centers and focus on quality. So um, we are absolutely have huge gaps yet, but we're beginning as a nation, I believe, to understand that there's a federal role in making sure that our states have the funding and resources and capacity at their level to deal with this. So building on that, tell us a little bit about your proposed solutions that have so much support in the Senate and across the country. Yeah. So taking all that I have heard, um, I, I wrote a legislation to address this um, called the Child Care Working Families Act that really addresses the key issues that I think are barriers for people. Uh, one of them is cost. I, I have talked to parents who have told me that they've been offered uh, a, an increase in their hours and they don't take it. They keep their family's income down because they can't find a place for their kids for full-time employment. I have had people tell me that uh, either the mom or dad, most likely the mom, decides not to go back into the workforce, which means she or he le le leaves out their skills. They um, watch their uh, cohorts continue to rise in the workforce and they're uh, forced to be out because they can't find daycare. And the worst stories of all are people who are leaving their kids in very unsafe conditions. And I can tell you, and I know if, if you have preschool kids, you know how this feels. If you, you don't feel your kids are in a good place, you don't do a good job. So Hard plus one. Yeah. <laughs> so th this is a really a critical issue. So our legislation does a number of things. Um, we make uh, the, pre uh, the funding for daycare a mandatory program in our nation, which will be a state-federal partnership uh, that any family in this country will not pay more than 7% of their salary if they are 150% of their state's medium income or lower, and it's on a sliding scale. This is huge. I'm telling you, a lot of parents pay 30 to 50% of their salary for daycare, and they have no extra money. So this becomes a huge barrier for them. So it basically says our country is investing in a federal-state partnership to make sure that people have the resources to have childcare. 
I feel good about that as a parent. I feel that's the right step for our country. But I will also tell you that this is important for our economy. Because if we want to have full participation and we want to earn to our full potentials, we have to have a workplace situation that allows people to have that earning capacity. I, my home state is the home to Amazon. People aren't buying on Amazon if they don't have their full economic potential. Uh, people aren't able to buy their basics if they don't have their full economic potential. So to me, this is a critical part of the infrastructure of our country in today's economy. Secondly, we deal with the issue that I alluded to a few minutes ago about salaries for our quality childcare teachers. The salaries are so low, the turnover is extremely high. And I will tell you, if you have constant turnover for your young kids, they have to readjust to an adult constantly. They don't trust, don't know. It makes a huge difference in their ability to learn. We know that our kids have tremendous learning capacity before they reach the age of five. And if they're losing out on that because of high turnover, our country loses, our communities learn out, that child loses. Um, so to me, having make, making sure that we have uh, teachers who are paid the kind of compensation that they deserve, equi uh, equal to what K-12 teachers uh, earn, means that we will have better quality teachers, higher, high, more highly trained, and m much more stable. Uh, situation for, for them and for, for the kids. And by the way, if you're teaching preschool, you deserve to earn a salary that helps your own family. Uh, so that to me was important and increases the access so that we have more slots available. I'm sure any of you who know a working parent or are one yourself know somebody who puts their name on a list for childcare before they even have a family. And then you worry every <laughs> yes. single day mm -hmm. um, because it is so hard to get into preschools. Now, in my state, uh, this is, in, like I said, in our cities, in our cities with a lot of wealth, in our communities, in our rural communities, it is a really important issue. In the state of Washington, we're very diverse. We have, obviously, the metropolitan area of Seattle, King County, um, a very uh, dense population, but we have a lot of really rural communities, and we have what we call the peninsula out on the uh, furthermost corner, corner of our state, and in a huge two-county area, there's, not, but there's only one preschool with 30 slots for all the families that live out there. To me, that is stunning. Um, and it means parents aren't working. It means they're leaving their kids in unsafe conditions. It means that uh, their kids aren't getting the kind of learning they need. And we leave those kids out, our country really hurts in the future. So to me, making sure that we have access to uh, high quality preschools across our country and early learning centers is a critical part of this. So at the National Women's Law Center, um, where I work, we often make the case that childcare is foundational to so many other issues that people might not realize that it connects to. Um, whether that's labor, forced participation, whether that is retirement security, because if you take time out of the workforce for a prolonged period of time, that's gonna affect your ability to retire with some level of economic dignity. Um, healthcare, housing, it's all related. And so can you talk a little bit about building the coalition for this bill and the kinds of stakeholders that have sort of come out to help build momentum for um, high quality and affordable childcare for everyone who needs it? Well, interestingly, I, I expected um, parents to be right there with me, and they are, but uh, I, I am just so grateful that so many of the communities and support groups that are out there that deal with health care or housing or, or many of the other family support networks that we have out there behind us. The surprising one to me, and I should have known this, um, was our police and sheriffs who tell me that the kids who lose out early on are the ones that end up in their jails. And I was in uh, a Spokane, Washington, a more rural part of our state, uh, and the sheriff um, there uh, start, was talking to me about you know, issues of security, and he said, by the way, I love your legislation. I'm sheriff in this town, and believe me, he was conservative, and he said, but my mom had Head Start, and if I didn't have Head Start, I wouldn't be the sheriff here. That's so, and he was the one who told me that of, of the, uh, about a lot of the young people in his jails, particularly high school age and younger, 
um, didn't have early childhood education. He said, I can see the difference in my own population of kids who had that support and that learning and you know, confidence and don't end up in our jails. And the other surprising uh, support for this that I've found is among the military because they are worried about recruitment today and we have a problem in this country today with quality um, people who can come into our, uh, into our defense system and be, join the Army and the Navy and the Air Force um, because they don't have the proper nutrition, they don't have the education skills. And if we do this early on, we will have a stronger national security, and they know it, and they tell me this. So thinking about the connection to K through 12 and higher education, because this is a forum that touches on education from all those different angles, can you speak a little bit about the relationship between access to high quality childcare and early learning and higher education in terms of parents' abilities to pursue new jobs, to skill up, um, and to really be able to have the kind of economic mobility that we wanna see in this country? Uh, th this is so important. Um, people today wanna to be in the workforce. I haven't met anybody who doesn't want a job, and oftentimes they need a skill. But you cannot go to college if you have two young kids, single mom or not, um, if, you, if you don't have access to childcare. It, it's a huge barrier for people to get the skills that they need to get a job that pays for their family. Um, so it abs absolutely is connected to our workforce issues and our ability for people to move ahead. It, I almost cry when I have people say to me, I'm desperately trying to get my college degree. I had a hard time when I was younger. Um, I'm older, which a lot of our students in co colleges are today, but I can't get childcare. Um, so I'm working at McDonald's. That's a, that's a skilled person, highly intelligent, who we are losing out in our economy because of one issue, childcare. So I think an, a growing national conversation that this connects to has also been one on racial equity. Um, both the fact that the largely women workforce that serves um, you know, our children are women of color or immigrant women, and also the fact that with the majority of babies now being kids of color or babies of color, that early education is so important for closing those long-term gaps um, in education. And so can you speak a little bit about uh, child care and early learning as a strategy that's central in achieving racial equity and really helping the economy fulfill its full potential on that front? Uh, the, the lack of access for early childhood education, quality early childhood education um, for minorities is exacerbated it, and uh, there's not slots where they feel comfortable living, uh, sending their kids to. There's a huge underground network of pe where people leave their kids with, um, you know, their next door neighbor or somebody that's not, the parks them in front of a television. And they see that their child is not getting equal access and that, that spreads through. If you don't er have early learning, you fall behind when you get to kindergarten. By high school, you're the one who drops out, and you end up in that jail I just talked about, um, and you never see yourself as being able to move past that. So this is really an important issue of economic justice. I'm also seeing, um, interestingly, a lot of um, cultural early childhood learning centers because, uh, for example, um, in our state, we have a Somalian community that is uh, established a, a early childhood learning center because they want the kids to learn the culture of their own country um, as well as ours and they are trying to do that at, at home not because they want their kids to be, be different but you know why because these kids get into school and they want the parents to be able to relate to their child um, and then for their child to be able to bring their parent in to help them s and support them. And if they have that a cultural difference from their parents because they haven't ever learned English uh, at home or don't have that kind of skill or be able to be cohesive as a family, um, they lose out and they see that. So we really need to address that issue. So one other question I wanted to touch on with you was one of supply. Because we know that there are a lot of places around the country called childcare deserts um, where it is it doesn't matter even if you could afford it. There's not a child care center that you can access. And so can you speak a little bit about what your bill does or what efforts are out there to increase the supply of affordable, high quality child care that then connects to K through 12 and so on? Sure, and this is where uh, I hear from a lot of parents that, you know, like I just told you, one child care facility in a huge, huge rural part of our area, you can't drive 100 miles to drop your child off. 
Um, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge. So one of the things the Child Care for Working Families Act is really provide the resources for those communities. First of all, if parents can afford child care and you have the ability to have those slots because it's, it, you know, parents have the money to do it and we help them with that, um, then we will have more child care facilities. But states are also need to step up in terms of making sure we have quality early childhood education folks. So paying them more uh, means more people will go into this field and stay in this field, and that will provide more uh, child care centers as well. So one more question and then a call to action. Um, the last question is really the relationship between child care, early learning, and democracy. Um, what does it mean, our child care and early education, in terms of preparing our future citizens? <laughs> and what does it mean for allowing their parents to be civically engaged? And if we want to see all this change, what role does child, a oh, no, range of issues, what role does child care and early learning play in both educating and enabling um, that kind of civic participation? Well, I I'm going to answer your question as a former preschool teacher. One of the things that my kids learned was how to listen to each other, how to solve problems, and how to work well together. Now that is the basis of any successful business. It's the basis of any successful democracy. I feel like I'm talking about the United States Senate here. Um, <laughs> it's, it is how we want our young people to be able to be so that we have a, a democracy that works. Um, we are sitting here in Washington, D.C., and one of my favorite buildings is the Library of Congress, and I love the fact that our founding fathers established the Library of Congress free so that our democracy would always be here because everyone would have the chance to learn to read, and that has to be a goal if we want a democracy to continue. Everyone needs to have that capacity so that we don't have uh, a, a country anymore where a few people um, can decide they have the ability to vote or to be a part of a democracy. Early learning is the same way. Um, we need to establish those skills early on uh, to be able to make sure that our democracy th thrives in the future. So I want to thank you um, for just being the foremost champion of childcare and early learning, um, which as someone who works at the National Women's Law Center has so many implications, not just for women, but for their whole families. Mm -hmm. What I wanna ask you to close out on is to sort of give us a call to action. Um, what can each of us do in our communities um, as uh, people who are citizens, as people who are engaged to help uh, make this vision a reality where every child has access to affordable and high quality childcare? I would encourage anybody who's part of an organization to put it as one of the goals for you. Our businesses need to be asking for this because their employers would do a better job if their kids are taken care of. Um, they will have a more diverse uh, workforce. Um, we, we need to make sure that people themselves are talking to members of Congress and advocating for this in the ways we advocate for everything. The one thing I know is that this has been a silent problem for a very long time. Because if you're that mom or dad at home struggling to get a job and to get your kids daycare, you don't want to whine about it because you don't want somebody not to hire you because you have kids. So this is a problem that many parents just internalize, fight their way through, stress over, and don't talk about. We have to make this a visible problem um, that is a, a goal that is just, it is achievable if we all put our minds to it and make it a priority. I feel like you're speaking for me, to me, <laughs> and on behalf of so many moms that we work with. And there's something really powerful about having someone who, with your experiences and passion in a position of power to really push for these changes. So I just want to thank you um, for everything you've done, for coming here today. I, I want to and, share one other story. Oh, do, because go. I think that, yeah. you know, I, as a former preschool teacher many years ago, I always wonder how those kids did. Uh, and I have a coffee every Wednesday morning and invite my constituents in. And this week, just two days ago, um, I, they would go through and say hello to me. And this woman who was in her mid-30s, really doing great, said, I, do you recognize me? And I said, no. And she oh said, I was a, a child in your preschool program <laughs> oh my in 1986. Gosh. And I was like, OK, see, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy. Yes. Democracy works. She's participating. She's doing great. And she learned the skills she learned in preschool and is now a thriving uh, person in our economy. That's what we need to do.